Good morning. Welcome to our morning worship service. And I invite all of you that may be fellowshipping in the lobby, come on in. And let's start the service off together singing about this wonderful truth, hymn 293. You, you will need your hymnals this morning. So let me challenge you to go ahead and get your hymnals out. Turn to 293, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. And let's stand together. We'll sing the first, second, and the fifth verse of this great hymn as we begin worshiping and praising the Lord this morning. Again, in your hymnals, 293, verse 1, 2, and 5. Let's sing it out. see each and every one of you and to be in God's house worshiping him looking forward to hearing from him and his word his spirit moving in our midst let's pray uh, right now if you will and uh, just before brother Caleb comes to lead us in our announcements and let's ask God to speak to our hearts I believe his word wants to do uh, the work this morning and let's pray and ask God to speak to each and every 
one of us individually. Brother James, would you stand and lead us in this prayer, please? Amen. I just want to take a couple of, just a moment quickly to once, one last time thank all of you for your faithful prayers for us this past week while we were away at camp. It was a wonderful week. Uh, the Lord uh, kept the vans together for us as we were getting there and coming on home, so we're grateful for that. But more than anything, we're just thankful for the saving, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as uh, this past week, we were able to watch one of our young ladies, Miss Caroline, come to know the Lord as her Savior uh, when she got home last night under the guidance of her grandparents. We thank the Lord for that. We had been praying. We've been praying for some time, and we're excited for just to see what the Lord has in store from her uh, from this day on, especially. <clears throat> couple of announcements for us. Uh, tonight, we are pleased to have Brother Tim McCrite with us uh, for our Revive Conference to kick us off. Uh, Brother Tim was actually one of my uh, professors in college, so I know that it's going to be an absolute blessing for us tonight. It's great to be able to uh, hear from him, to hear what God has laid on his heart to share with all of us for tonight. Uh, we also have our Moldova missions offering, however, uh, which that means uh, the offering taken up this evening, every bit of it, unless otherwise designated, will be going to our missionary, uh, Brother Grisha, uh, out in Moldova and Montiute, so please keep that in mind. <clears throat> Uh, they are still going through a difficult time right now with the ongoing war, so please continue to have uh, him and uh, their churches in prayer, brothers and sisters, as well as the people in general, that they will be able to be a light for them, to see the love of Christ, even in these difficult times for them. Uh, we also then next week, the kids are excited, back to school Sunday uh, next week. We actually have some of our uh, young people going back to school, not this coming up week, but next week. Uh, several of ours, I uh, know the uh, Wilson Christian, they're going to be starting their in-service back up this week. So please keep the, the teachers in prayer right now as they are preparing their minds and their hearts for another year of uh, ministering to the children as well and to the, uh, to the teenagers in high school and in junior high. Uh, then for our Revive Conference for the rest of the month, we are also going to be having uh, Dr. David Crow uh, next Sunday night, which we're, I'm sure we're all excited for. Uh, he will be preaching both the morning and evening service rather than just the evening service like the rest of the month for our Revive service. But he will also on the 15th, the following Monday, uh, have a service at 7 o'clock here on the church, so pl uh, at the church. Uh, so please, if you are able, be inviting uh, uh, friends, family, co-workers, uh, just so they can come and hear, the, the, come and hear what the Lord has has for all of us uh, uh, on those days. All right, that is all that I have for us at this time in the way of announcements. We're going to have a uh, time where we're going to be able to hear from our choir. Just before the choir sings, Caroline, come here. Uh, I kind of nicknamed her this week, Ashy Line, and um, I think we'll call it Caroline. And I was sitting in my recliner last night about 10.30, I guess it was. I'd have to check back on uh, my phone and uh, get a call from Miss Jenny and uh, called her back. And I was reading over uh, some notes, called her back, and uh, only spoke to Miss Jenny for about five, five to seven seconds. She said, hey, preacher, how are you doing? Uh, I got somebody who wants to tell you something. And, uh, and so at that point, I, I think the God bumps already started coming on me a little bit as I anticipated uh, this young lady uh, picking up the phone. And uh, what blessed me was that as she began to tell me uh, what uh, she had just done, it came with a broken heart and in a, in a broken voice. And can you tell the church this morning just briefly what you told me uh, when you got on the phone? What was one of the first things you said to me? Um, that I asked Jesus to um, forgive me for all my sins. Yes. And that I know that if I die right now, I'll be going to heaven. That's right. And uh, she said that, and uh, to me on the phone, in a broken voice, tears over the phone, she's crying, I'm crying on this end, and uh, on, on my end of the line. And then she said one more thing to me as I began to talk to her about, man, you know, 
walking her through. Uh, she'd already said the prayer and uh, just uh, making sure she had understanding. Uh, do you remember what you said about, about not waiting any longer? She said, I was walking with my Nana. They went to the store, I believe. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, the Jesus, Jesus <clears throat> the Lord was just speaking to me, telling me that I just really need to go get saved right then. I couldn't wait any longer. Yeah, and she turned to her Nana and said, the Holy Spirit still convicted me, a conviction that I believe probably started at the week of camp. And she said, I don't want to wait any longer. I want to get saved right now. Amen. Isn't that awesome, church? Let's rejoice with Caroline and that we're so proud of you and the thankful uh, for her willingness, you know, the Bible says no man can be saved unless he's drawn. And the Holy Spirit was drawing last night, and that is the way you respond to the Holy Spirit's draw. You don't put it off. You don't wait till you get to an official altar. How many of you are thankful you can make an altar wherever you're at, as many of us have done? So we're pr- so proud of you and going to be praying for you. And uh, Brother, Ca- uh, Brother Caleb, I've uh, been calling that all week. Brother Caleb and Miss Hannah are uh, going to be following up with her on some steps for new believers. And then we're going to be taking the step of following the Lord and believers' baptism. So we're so excited for you, proud of you. Thank God for what he did. We didn't want hi- to keep this blessing till Wednesday night, uh, that you can be seated now. The teens will be sharing uh, Wednesday night. Uh, and then I'll be preaching uh, after uh, they share just the week uh, that God gave us, but we didn't want that to wait. And some of you had already asked me uh, about not only the week, but any spiritual decisions, uh, but that hadn't happened yet when many of you had asked me, and uh, so it was late last night, but we're so thankful. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, God, God spoke to our kids' hearts, and uh, you already know this. We have some wonderful, amazing kids uh, here at Wildwood. We're blessed, and uh, was able to take them and uh, without any uh, problems, and their spirits were wonderful. Uh, they got there and began to mix and mingle. The way the wild uh, does things is they put them, uh, we're sponsors, but then they put them with uh, uh, counselors through the week uh, that are Christian Bible school, uh, uh, Christian Bible college students, and uh, they were amazing. I mean, I, I watched them closely uh, this year and talked to many of them. Their heart was on point. They were investing and pouring into the kids, going the extra mile, as we would say. And that was just a blessing to see. It was a blessing to see not only our kids interact with one another uh, uh, from our church, but then to interact with others. And I believe they made some bonds uh, this week. And many of us said, Preacher, can, yeah, we don't want to go back. You know, can we come back next week? You know, and so they had a great time. But let me thank you. I reiterate what Brother Caleb said. First of all, to Brother Glenn for making sure the van's ready when I heard I had to drive the old van I'm sitting here thinking man I do not want to take that van in the mountains and and it did b- bump on us and grind a little bit but boy it got us there and got us back and for a teen trip that far any vehicle that gets you there and gets you back and you don't have any problems that's a big thing to be thankful for and so we're very thankful for him checking those out make sure they were road worthy and then for all of you uh, who gave I love how you put it last night uh, when Miss Jenny called me and after I talked to Caroline Miss Jenny jumped back on for me and she said preacher what's awesome and she said Everybody had a part in this. And you think about it, that's true. You gave in such a way uh, that you relieved the burden for some of the families and kids um, that uh, would have been tough, and then you enabled some to go that maybe would not have been able to go. And everybody did have a part in in that, and uh, not just uh, those of us that were able to go with the kids. I do wish we could pack up the whole church and you all go and see the environment and what the kids are able to experience uh, there at camp this week. Just an amazing, amazing uh, time. So thank you for your help, your support, and the most important, your prayers um, as eternal decisions are made. Uh, camp such as this, and so we're th- so thankful. So Wednesday night, okay, we won't. We'll take one week off from our summer kids club, as the kids will be in here. All of them will be presenting by a testimony, telling you about different things. Brother Caleb will be sharing. I'll be uh, preaching briefly uh, at the end. So be here, okay, for that. Kids, go ahead and commit here. I'm going to go ahead and try to work on a plan on having the, the, the couple that uh, of kids that are not here this morning uh, here Wednesday night. We're going to try to help with that, but uh, I look forward to hearing uh, a full report of camp on uh, Wednesday night. All right, the choir is going to sing a new song for you uh, this morning. Uh, listen closely as we hope it'll be a blessing to you.
that it seemed I face alone Wondering why God left me here to struggle on my own I thought of all the verses and the scriptures I had read How he promised to Such a wonderful reminder, no matter, no matter what we've been through, what we face, God has always been faithful. Aren't you thankful for that? Great is His faithfulness uh, that we enjoy each.
each and every day. Grab your hymnals one more time, if you're so kindly will, and turn to that great hymn of faith, number eight. Number eight in your hymnals, great is thy faithfulness. And let's stand once again as we sing the first, second, third. for us to give back a portion of how he has so abundantly blessed us. How many of you realize that everything we have comes from the gracious hand of God? And uh, at any moment, uh, that could be gone, and uh, he could remove that hand of blessing. And uh, so I'm thankful that we get to give back to him. I hope you're faithful to do that. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless both the gift and uh, the giver uh, this morning as we worship him in our uh, giving. Brother Carol, would you lead us in this prayer, please?
the problem. Aren't you thankful we all know the answer to that? Nothing too hard for God. Let's take our Bibles and go to Revelation. It is Revelation, not Revelations, as uh, some often say. Uh, But Revelation chapter 2, please. Revelation chapter 2. Again, I'm excited uh, tonight to be starting off our Revive conference. We've done this several years now uh, with the purpose of helping us all to get out of uh, maybe a summer slump uh, that we have fallen into as uh, usually this time August comes. Some are starting uh, school. In fact, some of the kids on the trip with us this last week starting school this week like tomorrow and then many of the teachers go back and uh, then students the following week and so we're all kind of getting back into pocket and so uh, I'm trusting and praying that through these men Tim McCrite, David Crow, and Brother Henry Horn, Brother Lee Patrick, that God will use to, to help us that. But not only out of a summer slump, sometimes we fall into a spiritual slump, don't we? And uh, it's good uh, to be challenged throughout the course of the year. So that's our prayer with this Revive Conference. If you wonder why we do it, just to, uh, just to recharge our batteries and to get back hooked up to the terminal and to get our power and, and get our focus back where it ought to be. And so we trust that this month you will allow God uh, and His Holy Spirit to do that in our hearts. I've chosen a text this morning that's kind of going to set the stage for that. I bumped Brother Tim, uh, who'll be here tonight, and just let him know what I was preaching this morning. I don't know how God is, is leading him, and, uh, but let him know that I was going to try to set the stage, if nothing else, for the course of this month, uh, for us to be revived in our hearts. And as I thought about that, uh, this passage, the Lord uh, brought it to uh, my mind and my attention and so I want to preach from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Now, you know, uh, these letters to the churches can really be viewed at least threefold. One is prophetically in that each of these churches uh, that are written to here represent uh, the church age through the history of the church. When it began in the book of Acts uh, till when the rapture happens, each of these churches kind of describe uh, the church through the church age that we are living in. 
Second of all, you need to understand this literal. It, it was written to these literal churches uh, that uh, the, uh, John was writing to through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit concerned uh, for some things that they were going on not only in their communities but in their churches. So as we go through this, please understand this was literal. This was a uh, hand-delivered message, if you will, uh, to the churches at each of these cities. <clears throat> and then thirdly, it is personal. Okay, not only for the church today, uh, but here's where I want you to draw application. It is personal to us as individuals today. Okay, we can't do anything about uh, the, the prophetic part, the, the church age part. We can't do anything about the letter it was written to them, but we can receive it personally this morning, and that's my challenge for each and every one of us uh, to receive it personally. And so let's stand together to honor the reading of God's Word. Revelation chapter 2, we'll read verses 1 through 7. And again, we understand the context of it, but we're going to set application for us personally, not only as a church today, but as individual believers that make up the church. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. Jesus describes himself back in chapter 1 uh, with those terms. He says in verse 2, he says, I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Now, that's not terminology we will use today, but how many can understand that's a good thing? They cannot bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. So they're, they're getting some pats on the back here. Uh, to open up this letter of things that they are doing well. Uh, But then in verse 4, we see the word nevertheless, which is really a change of tone, kind of like when we see the word but, and it changes the tone of the text. Here he says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. For this thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. If you're taking notes this morning, write down the title simply as returning to your first love. Returning to your first love. As we pray, would we take that third application as individuals and say, God, would you help me to not build up a wall of defense this morning, uh, but to pray your Holy Spirit will speak to my heart and show me. Uh, Not that I've lost something, but if I've left my first love, God, would you show me that this morning? As we pray, if you'll say a, a brief prayer for my throat, uh, that it will hold up, and I thank you for bearing with me. Father, we need your help. Give us your power. May your spirit be manifested. Speak to hearts. Help us to be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You're familiar with the passage of Scripture. You're familiar with the church, a little bit uh, even the city. I will remind us that Ephesus in its day was a very powerful uh, city. It was a well-known city. It was a uh, well-populated city. They were located near the Aegean Sea, which was a large harbor harbor for commercial trade. And so they were a business industry, if you will, with people coming and going in their heyday at a very uh, heavy rate. Uh, They had established such a reputation that even though they were part of a Roman rule, uh, they were considered a free city and was allowed self-government even of their own city. Uh, and, that, and that was a big deal being that they were under Roman rule but yet were given that uh, freedom. Uh, so they had a lot going on uh, for them in power and again in the business world. But they also were a religious uh, city. And uh, one of the things that they hosted there was the home uh, to the Temple of Diana. There were several goddesses there that they uh, worship, but the Temple of Diana, which was actually one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, 
Uh, but she was the goddess of fertility. And so without having to explain that to you, you understand that gave uh, the community there, the society there, a very immoral uh, background. Those things were practiced and carried out in a, a wicked uh, manner. And so the church uh, that was in this city, they were faced with these difficulties all around them. And so this was not a breeze. This was not an easy pass through. Okay, this was a tough place uh, to minister uh, as they were ministering. And so we see three things that I'm going to give you, uh, as long as I don't choke on these throat lozengers, uh, the technical name for that. And I know I don't like to do that, but I need the help this morning. Notice, first of all, the deeds of the church, the deeds, the acts, the works of the church uh, that this letter starts off with. Look back at verse 2. He says, I know thy works, underline works. He says, and thy labor, underline labor, and thy patience, underline patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. They were false uh, uh, teachers and prophets and apostles. And hast found them to be liars. So Jesus begins here with a letter of encouragement, right? How many of you like encouragement? It's always good to hear positive things. And I was thankful yesterday when we came back and even some throughout the week texting parents. I was able to text them and tell them yesterday, man, your kid was great. And it wasn't one of those conversations, you know, where you had two or three bad things to get through and you just try to butter them up, you know, and say, hey, now your kid was great and fantastic, but, you know, it wasn't that thankful. It was all encouragement uh, uh, yesterday from camp. But here, that is what John is doing on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is he is kind of giving them some encouragement here on their deeds because the Lord does have to drill a little deeper, how many you understand, and get to the heart and really expose the problem that is there. So he, he starts off with some encouragement. And notice what he says. He said, first of all, your works are to be commended. He said, you, you're accomplishing things. You, you are busy doing the work of the Lord. Now, as I go through this, we understand their church and their time was a little different than ours. But I'm going to try to draw application to, to our church setting today. And so I think he would show up and say, hey, church, you're, you're busy doing the work of the Lord. I mean, I mean, you're busy reaching and loving people. Uh, you're, you're busy ministering to people. You got your Sunday school program going. You're trying to reach the community through different events and outreaches, and, and you're preaching the word. You got all these things going that you're accomplishing for the glory of God. Good job. You're, you're not sitting around on your hands wasting time. You are busy in the work of the Lord. He, he saw their works, and he acknowledged that. And then he goes on to use the word labor. He says, not only are you working, Lord, but the, the, the idea of laboring there is you are working and laboring to the point of exhaustion. Now, we all know what that is, okay, to work to the point of exhaustion, all right, and to drive yourself, drive yourself, drive yourself till you just wore out. Well, he's commending them for doing that, but notice, he's not commending them for doing that for working an 80-hour week or for walking 35 miles, you know, at, at camp this last week and staying up late and getting up early. He's commending them for their labor in the Lord. So not only are they busy, 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 but he says, listen, I, I notice and I commend you that you are not only working, but you're laboring, you're pushing yourself spiritually to the point of exhaustion, trying to do all you can. Well, how many of you agree with me? That, that, that's a good thing, right? That, that, that's a good thing to be commended for. It's not a good thing long-term for, for your health. But he said, I commend you that you're laboring to the point even of exhaustion. Your, your service to the Lord is fervent, right? You're, you're not doing it uh, just to fill the calendar. They served every opportunity they get and so this was not your show up two times a week Christian this was not your CEO Christian you know Christmas and Easter only all right these were people that were dialed in they were serving and they were even driving themselves to the point of exhaustion spiritually because they were doing so much and then he uses the third word about their deeds he said they were patient they were undeterred they were not distracted by the opposition. If you notice in verse 3, he said, uh, there came in among you those that are evil. You tried them, the apostles that came, and they, 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 they came with the right clothing on, saying they were the apostles, they were going to preach the word. He said, but you, you tried them, you listened to them, and you realized they were, they were in error, they were liars, and you rejected that. He said, you were patient through these times. He said, I commend you for that. He said, you've done these things well. You've rejected uh, uh, those false teachers down in verse 6 he echoes that thought he says about the Nicol Nicolaitans he says which I also 
uh, hate. And so twice he refers to uh, them rejecting the false teachings and doctrines of the day. Quick time out, how many you understand it's very important today uh, for the church in 2022 to reject the false teachings and doctrines that are trying to pollute the church today, amen? Because they're all around, they're knocking at the door, and as soon as we would let down the guard, they would rush in uh, to deter uh, from us from the path God has set us on. So they were in this sinful society. They refused to be tainted by the wickedness, and I'm thankful, by the way, for churches like that. More and more churches today are being tainted by the world, being changed little by little until they get to a point where they almost don't recognize who and what they are. The Nicolaitans were a a, a people here, a a sect of people that that taught man's actions didn't uh, affect his spiritual condition. Well, you understand that that gets off course real quick. That a man, a man can just live how he wants to, no matter what he professes, but he can live how he wants to, and that does not affect him, his life spiritually. Well, right there in verse 6, he says, you also hate them. I, I, I hate that as well. He didn't hate the people, but the false teachings and, and lifestyle that they lived. The Nicolaitans believe you could do as you please and to live as you wanted to live, and then as long as you just claim the name of Jesus on Sunday per se, then you were okay. And he commends them, church. He says, listen, your work, excuse me, your, your labor, your patience. He said that, that you, you, you've, you've understood what's going on around you, but you've stood your ground. You've resisted uh, the wickedness that was trying to inf- infiltrate the church. So he commends them for that. He says you've done a good job. And I would just challenge us in, in, in this light that in the day and age we live in where churches are changing at the drop of a hat, it's amazing. You know, I know technology as it is today has not always been around, but if it would have been used as much as it is now a couple decades ago to go back and listen to, to services from some churches from 10, 15, 20 years ago and listen to them now and you think you're in two different worlds. Did that change overnight? No, it usually doesn't. But little by little, and I'm going to give you a quote here that, that as I was just studying, the Lord gave to me. And I put this down, what we tolerate today will dominate tomorrow. What we tolerate today will dominate tomorrow. If we came in here with a, 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 a whole different lineup of service, you know, and we were jamming to the Lamb and we were rocking out for Jesus, you know, there would be a big throwback. And, man, what in the world? Pastor really did bump his head at camp. You know, he fell down and hit a rock. You know, what's going on? We reject this and, and we're not going to tolerate this. But slowly by slowly, churches have begun to tolerate one thing after the next. And I'm telling you, we've seen this in the last decade, what was tolerated a decade ago, just 10 years, now dominates churches today. And that is slowly going to happen. And so here we want to partner up in this part, this part only, with the church of Ephesus. Hey, man, we want our deeds to be right. We want to hold our ground. We want to take a stand against the filth and the wickedness that's trying to infiltrate the church. And we want to be busy doing what God would have us to do. Verse 3 goes on to echo that, how the opposition, he says, and has borne and has patience for thy namesake, has labored and has not fainted. He said, man, even in the difficult times, this is not a message about not giving up, but he puts it here in verse 3. He says, even in the difficult times, you didn't give up. You didn't quit. You, you kept at it even when ministry was hard. And so here we read these first three verses and you scratch your head and you say, preacher, they got everything going for them. And at this point in our text, it seems that way, doesn't it? They're hard workers, they go the extra mile, they've been patient, and they've withstood the wickedness that's trying to get inside their walls, and they've kept it out. They were busy doing the work of God, but notice this, something changed. So the deed of the church was recognized, but now notice the diagnosis that's given to the church in verse 4. We come to that word that's a transition word, nevertheless, in spite of. I know I've just said all these good things about you. You know, it's when you have that talk and you you mention some good things, and then you say, okay, now I need you to sit down for this part. Well, he says, nevertheless, you got these things going for you. But notice what he says in verse 4. I, think about this statement, I, this wasn't another church in town. This wasn't somebody in the congregation that was in opposition. This wasn't some 
spiritual leader in the community saying this. He says, I have somewhat against thee. How many of you know that's a statement that should wake us all up? Jesus, the Holy, and the Holy Spirit speaking through John saying, hey, 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 you got your deeds going on, but I've got something against you. And here's what he says. He says, because, here's why I have something against you. Because thou hast left, underline the word left, and get right here if I don't say it later. It doesn't say lose. Don't, don't, don't let the devil take you on a rabbit trail that's not worth going on. He says, you have left, not lose, but you have left your first love. So he applauds them, he encourages them, but now he gives them the diagnosis and he addresses the problem. See, the church at Ephesus, they're like many churches today in America. They look good on the surface, but the problem was in the heart. I've said for a long time now, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And although they looked good, although they were busy doing ministerial work, the Lord knew there was a deeper problem that was rooted in their heart. And he addresses that here with them. The word nevertheless, it, it, again, it's a tone changer. They go from, from praising them to now abruptly ending the praise and coming to this sharp turn in the road where they mention something, hey, that was not only problematic then, but he puts such emphasis on it because why? It endangered the church in the future. In fact, if you follow the city of Ephesus, you see it cost them greatly because of what he's about to diagnose right here. All right, tune in, church, and pay attention because here's the meat this morning. They, the church people, those claim to be followers of Christ, those that had spiritual bones under their flesh, they had left their first love. What was once a priority for them in spiritual realm was no longer a priority for them. There was a time when their love for Jesus was vibrant and it consumed everything they did. And you could see it on their face. You could hear it in their voice. You could see it in their actions. Their zeal for the Lord at one time was unmatched by anything. How many of you know that you can, you can tell what's on the inside of a person by those three things I just mentioned? Watching their face, listening to their words, and watching their life. It reveals a lot more about us than we know. Just pay attention when you're talking to somebody about something that excites them. They're going to do it with some exuberance, aren't they? I was watching some of the teens as they were, or, or uh, juniors as they were telling their parents yesterday, they got back, Mom, I did this, I did this. And they weren't sad about it. They weren't all despondent about it. They, they were excited about it. And he says here, there, there was once a time in your spiritual walk, you were vibrant and everything about Jesus co- consumed you, not just by what you said, but it was on your face. It was in your life. It showed out in your actions. You were enthused about what you were doing for the cause of Christ. Now, don't get me wrong here. Don't leave me because this, this, this would be an error to, that some of you would use to excuse yourself from this message. They hadn't ceased to love Jesus Christ completely. You with me on that? They hadn't ceased to to follow him or be called by his name, but what he's talking about here is that deep, passionate love for God and the things of God that they had, once had, was no longer there. And listen to me right now, whether you like it or not, that is where a great part of the church of 2022 rests today. The love that they once had when Jesus Christ first saved them is no longer present in their life. They love him and they want to follow him, but it's from a distance and it's on their terms. It's not like when they just fall in love with Jesus. Oh, he saved me by his grace through faith and he saved me from death and hell. I could never repay him. I want to do everything I can to live for him and serve him. That type of vibrant, energetic, committed love. I'm telling you, church, is missing in our churches today. Outwardly, they were busy. But inwardly, they were cold and indifferent. And Brother Linwood, I don't know there's too many phrases that explains the church of America today than that right there. 
outwardly vibrant, busy. I mean, you look at the calendar like, good grief, when does this, these church folks sit down to eat? You know, boom, 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 this, 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 go here, go there, do this, do that. But inwardly, they were cold. They were indifferent. He says, why? Because you have left your first love. Warner Wiersbe, our author, says this. He says, they were so busy maintaining their separation. Pause the quote. Remember, they were separated from the wicked in their society. Did you get that underneath their deeds? You good on that? They were separated, as we would preach today. But he says they were so busy maintaining their separation that they were neglecting their adoration. I would say this. We get so busy sometimes about, I don't know a better word to call it, we get so busy sometimes about church politics that you come to church and you forget why you're coming. You with me right here? You stay with me, I'll preach this part a lot quicker. If not, we'll be here for a while. No, I'm just kidding. But sometimes we get so consumed with the little this and the little that that we forget who we're coming here to offer our praise to. That, that love we once felt when Jesus said, I mean, it was all we could do. We couldn't wait, Brother Wayne, to get to the house of God, to worship him, to hear from his word, to fellowship with his people, to encourage and be encouraged. And all of a sudden, something happens and we get worried about all these small details that does not matter. And we have left our first love and we're no longer vibrant and consumed with the love of God like we once were. And I'm telling you, it affects us more than we realize and more than we want to admit. Did they love the church? Yes. Did they still have their doctrines? Yes. Did they still have their ministerial activities going on? Yes. Were they still busy for the cause of Christ? Yes. Did they still have some love in them for the things of Christ? Yes. Well, the point is they did not love Jesus like they once did. It was no longer a supreme love. And can I just tell you, when he is not our supreme love, everything else will eventually fall apart when we leave our first love. You can mark it down. The word left there is an expressive word that means to send away, to expire, or to forsake. And I think that's what they had done. I want you to think with me this morning, if you will, just for a moment. Back to the day you got saved. How many can you remember when you got saved? Raise your hand. You can remember the day. You may not remember all the details, but you can remember the day, the time Jesus saved you. Hold your hand up. Almost everybody here, if not everybody. But we remember that time. Think about the, the love that abounded in your heart. Isn't it such a blessing when, when someone new, yeah, you can remember, can't you? When someone new gets saved, the excitement that they have. And if you're involved in ministry, even sometimes in, 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 in a lay uh, position, such as a teacher or whatnot, you, you feel that enthusiasm from a, a new Christian, a newborn Christian. I mean, they're excited. They, they want to be involved in everything. They want to learn everything. They got, they got 101 questions, right, about the Bible and about Jesus. And, and they're so engaged and they're so excited and they can't wait. What time is church Sunday night? Do you have Wednesday? Oh, great, you got Wednesday night. What time is that? Do you have any Bible studies during the week? you have any activity? I mean, they want to be involved in everything they possibly can because they're so excited and they're in love with Jesus who has saved their soul. Back at that time, if you'll go with me, there was a time you couldn't get enough of Jesus, right? You loved him and you craved to hear his word, both taught and preached, and you longed to sing his praises every chance you had. And you loved the fellowship of his people, every opportunity, the doors are open. You loved to read his word on his own. You loved to be, be in every service. You loved to spend time praying with him. Why? Because you were thrilled as a newborn Christian for everything that he had done for you. You're excited. And we would say today you were in love with the Savior who had given everything for us. And as you think back on that time in your life, and you're thrilled and you're happy and you're experiencing that first love, hear me now, church, there was no excuse that would keep you away from church, was there? There was no person that could hurt your feelings or say something that would cause you to stay away from church. There was no alternative motive in you coming to church. There was no distraction that could keep you from rejoicing in the God of your salvation. But I'm here to say today, sadly, that that has changed for 
people in the church today. Love tends to fade with time. Many of you could raise your hand that you're saved longer than I've been alive. And that's great and awesome, but the danger about that is that first love begins to fade. And the reason you were serving God and coming to church and all enthused and thrilled 25, 30, 35, 40 years ago is not the same reason that you sit where you sit today. Do you still love Him? Are you still a Christian and a follower? Yes, but you have left that first love. You're no longer zealous like you once were. When we do come to church, ask yourself now, are you coming out of love and excitement for the things of God, or are you coming out of habit? Do you praise Him in song with the joy that you once had, or are you just moving your mouth because that's what everybody else is doing, it's what you're expected to do? As a teacher, do you teach with that same excitement even now uh, that you did once Jesus saved you? Do you have that same enthusiasm when you walked into the class, when you first did after being saved and being able to serve Jesus Christ? Do you have that same excitement? Do you have that same excitement when you stand here in the choir and minister out to your fellow believers in Christ? Do you have that same excitement? You see, my friends, we ought not to get over our salvation. We ought not to let those feelings of joy and exuberance and excitement be dismissed from our service to the Lord. One man said this way, he said, you can work for the Lord, but not be in love with the Lord. And hold on to your bootstraps, that is very true. You can work for the Lord, a lot of times it's for yourself, but you can work for the Lord, but not really be in love with the Lord. But he goes on to say, but you cannot be in love with the Lord and remain inactive. I like that part too, and that's, that's, that's convicting. You can't be in genuine love with the Lord and be a bystander and be inactive. The church of Ephesus was active, but they were serving out of a sense of duty now. And here's where I just want to make sure we're careful to apply. I'm your pastor. I love you. I want to help you. I want to share the truth with you. And listen, I've said this for years. I'd rather someone, I wouldn't rather it happen, but I'd rather someone after the service express their dissatisfaction with me and can't believe I would say this or that now and be unhappy with me now than to get the judgment day and say, Pastor, you are our under-shepherd. Why did you not warn me of my spiritual condition? I don't want that to happen up there. So I'm going to do my part now. And put it on the table. What you do with it is between you and the Lord. But loving as your pastor, I'm going to tell you right now, for some of you, for some of us, this is right where you are at. You're a Christian. You're in the church. You're doing a work for the Lord. But you have lost your first love. It's not like it used to be for you when you first got saved. You've lost your joy. You've lost your enthusiasm. You've lost your excitement. And although you may be busy, you have left your first love. You may be active, but you've left your first love. You may be involved in ministry, but you've left your first love. And now, where all that used to consume your mind was God's love for you and His mercy and His grace and His love and His forgiveness. Now you're more worried about who does this and who does that and why we do it this way and why can't we try this and you like this and you don't like this and you're concerned about all the petty things that don't matter in eternity. It's quiet, but I'm just telling you it's because you've drifted from your first love. You see, a new believer, and we don't have this problem here, thank God, but a new believer don't come in here and say, well, I can't believe the carpet is speckled and not a solid color. A new believer doesn't care what the carpet looks like because a new believer realizes the carpet didn't save them, amen? Jesus Christ saved them, and they didn't come to church to adore all the things around them. They came to church to adore and worship and pay honor and respect to the one who did save them. Amen? Why? Because they're in love with Jesus Christ, and they've not gotten over it. We need churches today. My goodness, I could preach on this for a while. We need churches today. 
they'll fall in love with Jesus all over again. And go back to the day, to the week, to the moment in your life where Jesus saved you. And you didn't care about nothing else except for the fact that he saved you. And then he gives you the privilege to serve him. Why in the world do we get to the point? Oh, we may dress up and look the part and our deeds are good. But our heart... I hope you love me, not hate me. But I'm, I, again, I'd rather tell you now than you get up there and look back at me and say, why didn't you tell me? Your heart is not where it needs to be. Why? Is it because you're living in sin? No. Is it because you've deserved a Savior and you've committed a part? No. But it is because you've left your first love. And although on the outside, you may look the part. On the inside, it's not there. And there's danger here. Because remember, I told you, he gives this stark contrast and warning because it endangers the church in the future. Don't forget that I told you that a few minutes ago. Yeah, it's a big deal when people get to the point they left their first love. Can I tell you, it's a big deal in the church today when you come to a service more consumed in your mind and thoughts with other things, politics, whatever it is about the church rather than the one you come to worship. And some of you come with such a cloudy mind, focus on things that are lesser priority. Again, I love you, and I'm trying to help you, and I hope the Holy Spirit can use his word today to help you get back on course. But I'm telling you, we've lost our first love. And we're focused on these things, rather than focusing on Christ. <laughs> Let's look at the third thing quickly. He's given their deeds and he's given them the diagnosis. And how many of you know when a diagnosis is given by a doctor? Now, oftentimes it's assumed and highly recommended, but sometimes there's a choice a family has to make, right? Say, well, we want to do these treatments. We don't want to do these treatments. We want to start these meds. We don't want to start these meds. So we've been given the diagnosis. And can I tell you, you can think what you want to about this preacher, but the Holy Spirit is never wrong. You can build a wall if you want to, but you're only in troubling yourself and endangering yourself more. By becoming stiff-hearted. So then there's a decision to make. That's your third and final point this morning. We're going to be done. The diagnosis has been given. You can receive it. You can walk out of here happy. You can walk out of here mad. The diagnosis has been given. There's a decision for you. Remember, we're applying this personally. For you personally as an individual to make. Jesus didn't come to hurt them. He came to help them. And now he tells them how they can fix What's wrong? Look at these words quickly. Look at verse 5. Underline these words if you don't mind. Verse 5. Remember, there's your first one. Therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Here's your second one. And repent. And then your third one comes by way of phrase. And do the first works. We'll stop there at those first three. Remember, repent, and what we'll call return. Or it says do the first works. The first works. You, you drifted from that. You've left that. Return to those first works you did. Back when you were genuinely and fervently in love with me. Jesus reminds them, you, there was a day where your joy abounded. There was a day you came and all the focus was on me. There was a day you sang those songs of praise from a true heart of worship. He says, but your light has faded. And there's just a dying ember left. I've already challenged you to think back on that day Jesus saved you and that joy that you had. Let me ask you this. Can you honestly say that you are still head over heels in love for Jesus today? Like you were then. Now, before you just answer that, oh, yeah, preacher, bye, 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 bye. And the Holy Spirit knows. Quit playing games. Are you still in love with Jesus today like you were when he first saved you? I can tell you this. If we were, it would show on our actions. It would be heard in our conversations. But no, we're, we're so distracted. We've left our first love. So he says, remember. Go back to that time. Do us all good. We close out this service into this afternoon. Go back to the day he saved you. If you kept a journal, look at that journal. If you had a Bible, somebody, look at it. Go back to that time and realize what he did for us when he saved us. Redeemed us, forgave us of our sin. We were undeserving, wicked sinners. How could we ever get over of that? How can we ever belittle that and focus on things that don't matter and, and not be focused on what he has done for us? 
So he says you need to first of all remember. Then he speaks of repentance. We've already read it in verse 5. I ask you to underline it if you're doing that in your Bible. He says, and repent. The word repent speaks of a change of mind that leads to a change of action. So you can change your mind about something sitting here, but if you go back out and you have the same conversation and you go about life the same way and you have the same grouchy spirit and you have the same focus, then you haven't repented, you haven't changed nothing. All you've done is acknowledge it, which is the first step, but he says you repent of it. He says you change your mind, and he says it changes in your actions. He's telling these people that they need to repent of the sin of not loving him like they should. You said, preach, how do I take care of all this? Let me, let me tell you very simply, according to this text, how we take care of this. Fall in love with Jesus all over again. Fall in love with Jesus all over again and make him a premium in your life. And I'm telling you, all the other things that distract you will begin to fade away. And I believe you actually experience a freedom, a freedom that you'll have just by loving Jesus like you once loved him. See, repentance is one of those things that has fallen by the wayside in our modern churches. Hello. I hear some crickets, but that's about it. Come on now, repentance is fine. You can't be right with God if you don't repent of some things in your life. And I know this ain't no message going to get televised and get 10,000 thumbs up, but it don't really matter. I care about souls, not how 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 many people like me. You can't be right with God until you get to a place of repentance. Not just acknowledging it here, but changing it in your life. And our hearts have grown so cold We no longer see the need for repentance. Altars that once were filled with tears of those desiring a closer walk with God now remain empty. I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times, it's not the people on the altar that I'd be concerned about. It's the ones not on the altar that I'd be concerned about. Why? Because we we are not perfect. And we mess up on a weekly, if not daily basis. And yet we've lost our zeal and our desire to know him and serve him like we once did. Let me challenge you here. Sin does not go away. It it doesn't just disappear. You can't just sweep it in a rug. You can't just move on like it didn't happen. You got to deal with it. And I challenge you this morning as the Holy Spirit, I can't, but as the Holy Spirit has put, I I, I actually wanted to preach something else this morning. About midweek, God, God, God shifted me and said, "Uh uh-uh, that's not it. I mean, I had my notes going. He said, you saved that. And he brought me to this. Why, I don't know, but he knows. But if he speaks to your heart, I challenge you to do something about this morning because here, here's the danger. You have remember, you have repentance. You, you do have an option to return. Underline the phrase in your Bible. Help me, Lord, finish. Underline right here. He says, and do the first works. Do. Go back to the first works. That means they had drifted to some other stuff. They had drifted to some outward duties, but they weren't doing the things they first did when they fell in love with Christ. And he's telling them they need to repent of their sin and go back to doing the first deeds. You ever wonder, think about this with me, you ever wonder why churches grow stagnant and folks no longer come? Now, if you wrote a book on the excuses you heard, Ronnie, you, you, I don't know if you have a printer, that, uh, a publisher that would print it. It'd be too large, the excuses that are given for why churches begin to grow stagnant and people no longer come. But you could really write a book with it being on one page why they don't. Don't get mad at me. Remember, I'm just a delivery boy. I'm just throwing the paper up to the doorstep this morning. That's because you left your first love. Can I get three amens to drill a little deeper here? That's more than three. I, I love you. I promise you. But you know why churches across America will have 30, 40, 50, maybe more people back in church tonight than they do this morning? People have fallen out of love with Jesus. You know why midweek Bible studies are so hard to find? I've already told you about the struggle we had finding a place. And when we did find one, the lady said, we, 
We may have 10, 12 people here. You know why? I'm telling you, because we've left our first love. You see, when you first got saved, you couldn't get enough of Jesus. You were at everything, and you were at everything with a smile, not out of duty. If you're doing it out of duty and obligation, you might as well quit now because you ain't fooling God. But you know why we struggle with these things, brother? Because we've left our first love. And he says, he begs, he says, listen, return. You're not doomed right now. You're not dying and going to hell. You have an opportunity to return, to go back and do the first things that you once did. Go back to reading your Bible every day. Go back to meditating on Scripture. Go back to praying every day. Go back to being faithful to God's house every time the doors are open. Be faithful to God's house. Every one of us, every one of us can go back in our minds to a time and a place where our relationship with Jesus Christ was at its peak, where we loved him. And we wanted everything to do with him. But we've left it. Hear me carefully as I said in reading the scripture. We have not lost it. You've left it. And he says here, return to your first works. I implore you. I challenge you. Not to walk out here upset and mad at anybody. I mean, good night. If you went to the doctor and you got cancer in your body, how many of you want him to tell you you got cancer and not a scratch on your big toe? The Holy Spirit's trying to help you this morning. And you've got an option to return, or you can deal with the fourth R, which if you keep reading, it says it's removal. He says, I will put out your light where you are no longer of any use. And if you follow the church of Ephesus, and even if you went now on a missions trip, you would find the ruins of what used to be, Brother Wayne, of what used to be. But because the people left their first love, were they dressed up? Yeah. Were they doing the works of the Lord? Yeah. Were they, were they busy? Do- yeah. But it was all outward. And their fire and their love on the inside had vanished. And it's happening in America today right in front of our eyes, and we're not even smelling it. Return, return Why he gives us time before we are removed and our light for the Lord is vanished and put out. Would you bow your heads with me kindly, please? You can mark this down as we pray. A church that loses its love This genuine, fervent love will soon lose its light. That's exactly what happened to the church of Ephesus. And 